Welcome to Toxicology, brought to you by Recovery Unplugged, the place where we talk about all things substance abuse, recovery, and mental health, with guests offering varying perspectives and viewpoints. Hosts Joseph Gorordo and Jason Cabello share about their addiction and recovery and other serious subject matter through lighthearted yet candid conversation. One, two, three, shoot. <laughs> you intro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Toxicology. Ology, the, ology, ology, ology. The greatest podcast in the known universe, universe about universe, universe, addiction, universe, throwing my phone on the floor, mental health, 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 health. and recovery. recovery, and music. Recovery. I'm it's talking music, more about music, music these days because I love music. Um, I'd like to talk more about skateboarding, but we'll get to that. That's We'll get to that another day. Day, 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 day. <laughs> How you doing, Joseph? <laughs> I am not well. Sir. Joseph is a stress ball today, <laughs> but that's uh, okay. You know, you look, look, it's such a cliche and you know, I hate the cliches, but like my best day sober is <laughs> my worst day sober is still better than my best day using. <laughs> yeah. Is it? I mean, look at like, yeah. like my problems today is like, you know, I got a text that I didn't like from someone at work. My wife's a little sick, so I had to drop off. Handle drop off for all three kids this Your morning. Your beautiful three children. Yes. You, you had to spend some extra time with them. Extra time with them. Uh, I I didn't because my wife was sick. She didn't pick up my dry cleaning yesterday, so I had to go to the dry cleaners in my shorts and <laughs> pick up my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I left my coffee on the counter at my home. Okay, at your beautiful home. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you, you know. do you remember days when you couldn't even afford coffee? Uh. Or you, I mean, I, I'm not going to say couldn't afford, but had better things to spend your money oh, on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at one point, you know, my home was my Toyota Camry yeah. in the back of a Walmart, you know? Fucking a, dude. So, like, it, they're all high-class problems. Yeah. yeah. But it's all relative. Yeah. It is all relative. The pain is the same. Yeah. The stress is the same, no matter, you know. Um, but that's a gift of recovery, is knowing that this too shall pass. And there's nothing you can't fix with a little uh, spiritual practice and uh, and Red Bull. Red Bull is that the uh, <laughs> the cure all? Good for what ails you. I mean, when it's 10 a.m. and you know the rest of the day is going to be an uphill battle, you kind of preemptively. I kind of preemptively over caffeinate and let's just. Do so, it. are you projecting an uphill battle for the rest of the day? Is my question. Oh. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be an uphill battle, but the, it's going to be a long day. There, yeah. There, I have a series of tasks that must be accomplished. Yeah. And I don't have my right hand back up lady at 100% today. Gotcha. So, you know, it's like, I gotta, gotta work, which I have a great job that I'm grateful for. Yeah. Then I gotta rush home. I gotta go get Ella from preschool that we can afford to pay to send her to. Then I gotta go to Academy to pick up track spikes for my irresponsible 13 year old, <laughs> drive them to the track meet, give them to him, go home, take my 11 year old to baseball practice and run the baseball practice before returning to the track meet to watch my kid run 1600 meters. Wah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a lot of shit. It's a lot of shit. You know, I know it's high class problems. No, but it's you know, but it's 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 important to say you know, and and good on you for <laughs> saying like, hey, I'm feeling shitty today, and, and things aren't going great. But you know, life is life. Life is life. Life is life. You can handle it. When I when I it was when I first got clean or, and was going to meetings, um, I would go to a meeting that had a lot of old timers, a lot of NA old timers, yeah. a lot of guys in like their seventies who like used in pre Giuliani New York and you know, <laughs> just like real fucking even though they're in their seventies, you know they could kick this shit out of you. Yeah. And this guy like comes in the treatment van and holds the meeting hostage. Like so for those of you who don't know, when you go to a twelve step meeting you have the opportunity to share. Yes. 
Um, and you can choose to focus on solution. Correct. And a lot of times people are new. They don't really understand that, you know, but it, it's it's OK. It's OK that you come in there and do that and dump your problems. And then you learn. That's why they say keep coming back. You learn how to yeah. you learn the etiquette of meetings. But at first you will go there and just spew. Yeah. So this I'm guy's so sad. I so can't this guy's talking about anymore. he's like, my friend's texted me and he's texted me the stuff. And then he goes, LOL. And I say, put a T on the end of that. And it's life on life's terms. And that's all that means. And like this whole time, <laughs> it's like 70 year old dude from New York is like. I'm here for uh, talking about uh, my problems with drugs, and this guy's talking about fucking alphabet soup. <laughs> <laughs> I love the old timers. Oh man, that that impression! I had a, it reminded me of the sponsor I used to have back in the day. It was Boston John. Guess mm-hmm. where he was from? Queens, Connecticut. No, no he's from <laughs> Boston. And uh, the way we would meet is whenever we were having like a sponsor sponsee meeting, I would drive to his home. He'd be sitting on the porch waiting for me. He'd hand me a cigar. We would both light the cigars. And we'd he'd pontificate and blah, 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 Joey, I'm gonna tell you. Blah. And then when the cigar was done, we were done. Mm. <laughs> that was the amount of time <laughs> for the sponsorship. That that's a pretty good um I mean, hour glass. We get like a solid hour. I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I like God, yeah. I wish I smoked cigars <laughs> with my uh but I, I have to say, so you know, I've been we we talked about my one sponsee who I was struggling with. He was struggling. He came out here. He kept yes. on going back and forth. He's fucking killing it now. Yeah. So I'm not going to break his anonymity by saying his name, but you know who you are. I'm proud of you. You're fucking killing it. Keep it up. Oh, that's so nice. He, he, it, and it really like, it, it got to the point where I think he had to, get that close to losing absolutely yeah. everything like back up from his family is this the guy we you talked about on the nikki episode yes yes yeah okay yeah. good for so, him yeah i and, like him. And he's doing really really well that's right you know him he's doing yeah. really really well he he's in a place that would not have been his first second third fourth or fifth <laughs> choice as a place to uh spend spend some yeah. time but you know he has the opportunity to leave if he wants to yeah. you know we'll put it that way and He's do, he's doing it, man. He yeah. he's and he like I see the psychic change. Like I'll just talk to him, and he's not talking yeah. to me about all the bullshit. Yeah. Like he's not talking to me, and not bullshit, but he's not yeah. talking to me yeah. about all the things that Are he can't control right this yeah. second. But he still wants to. Like he he's, I see an inner peace in him, which I love. That's amazing. You know what's really nice, and it's just, and we'll get to the guest, but you you know, you just gave him like words of affirmation, and I think that. In our world, there are not many opportunities, or it's, it's rarer than it should be for a man to give another man words of affirmation. I think I think the women got us beat on that, like supporting each other. I don't know. I know some pretty catty women. I know. I, I, know. I you know what? That's a terrible word to use, and I'll take yeah. that back. Um, all right. Well, but but you know, so Grant, the other we're going to edit that one out. <laughs> the other day, probably this was probably like a month ago, right? I got I got called from the local news station to give a comment on something or another going on in the legislature. And um, my old boss and mentor, Steve Thomason, he uh, he texted me. He's like, hey, I just I was cooking dinner and I, I heard your voice on the TV because I had the news on. I ran over like, man, I'm so proud of you. And, and I sent him a text back. I was like, wow, Steve, like you're probably like the only adult man that like has ever said that to me or you know that says stuff like that to me and like i'm super grateful for that he's yeah. like now you're making me cry and i was like all right oh, that's nice. but you know like we don't really do enough of that jason we don't we don't side side note <laughs> it reminds me of this story here so uh gabby friend of the show my, my partner good uh, with the words of affirmation well, no. So I'm talking about the the voices, uh, the voice on TV. So yeah. we're we're driving through Miami and we're we're arguing, and I think it was one of those times because he's like, "Jason, just be quiet, okay? That's all you need to do is just be quiet." And we're listening to the radio, and one of the recovery unplugged spots that I did the voiceover for comes oh, on no. the radio. <laughs> did it diffuse all the tension though? Absolutely not. Oh no. Okay. All right. Well, so let's let's, get, let's get. I think <laughs> what you need right now is negativity be gone and speaking of negativity be gone <laughs> <laughs> that is one of just one of one of the many positive things that our guest today has to say bruce Brackett. <laughs> and you are in where, where are you where are you yeah 
I am in the Poconos in Pennsylvania. Very Ooh. nice. Very nice. Where it is a winter wonderland as we speak. Oh, uh, man. It's going to be like 85 in Texas. <laughs> I'm so jealous. I'm I, like winter's leaving. Texas. Do you want to trade? I, I would absolutely <laughs> love to trade. Yes. No, nah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. You are good. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bruce, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank Hi, you, Grant and Jason. Thank you so much for having me and everyone a part of Recovery Unplugged. It's it's so great to be here. Thank you. Grant is our behind the scenes man, and this is Joseph. Oh, Joseph. Hi, hello. Hi. Oh my goodness! Excuse me. It's no, okay. no, it's, it's okay. okay. It's all right. Grant Grant's the magic maker. He is the 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 Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Well, hi, Grant, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> Not to be confused with behind the scenes Greg, who also does our behind the scenes stuff, but he's more uh, he he's, he's gotten a big promotion. He so got a promotion. Congrats yeah. to uh, behind yeah. the scenes Greg. We haven't talked about him. My mom always asks about him. So, so shout out to behind the scenes Greg. So yeah. Bruce, I got to look at your Instagram this morning for about thirty seconds, and I feel like within the first three videos, like. I did. I did feel a little bit, a little bit better. I had a rough morning today, and and I watched your first three videos, and just like from the moment you're like, "Hey, here's a couple," I was like, "Oh, this is nice. This is nice." Um, Thank but, you. That means yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's why you do it, right? But um, what I have found in my experience, and and maybe I'm wrong, but is that people who find an overwhelming uh, sense of positivity and happiness that doesn't just come naturally. Like there's usually uh, some stuff that takes place to get to that. Am I wrong? I think it's to each their own. Yeah. Um, but I, I, in my case, particularly, I, a lot of my shine comes from trauma, comes from a very dark place yeah. in my past. Um, and you know, I think that there are people who are inherently just kind of on the happier side. Yeah. Um, and it, it's so funny because I get asked this question a lot. That is not me. Yeah. Like, yes, that is me in <laughs> that curated yeah. version yeah. on, you know, that's what I do. But I'm not like that. <laughs> yeah. of the time. I am not. <laughs> I, I can go left and right and be all of the other emotions. I'm human. So yeah. I, I do have that. But. Uh, the reason why I do what I do is because in this world, we are lacking the side of positivity. There's so much going on in all aspects, all across the globe, where I have found a lot of comfort. Everything I post is something that I need to hear. And if I need to hear it, chances are there's someone else that needs to hear it, too. Um, so it's very much a two-way street. But I, I keep doing the positivity because it, it's just, it's lacking in this yeah. world. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, that, you know, you found kind of this mindset, this mentality, whatever you want to call it from, you know, from kind of going through some difficult stuff, some trauma, as you put it, you know, wh why don't you, I mean, tell us a little bit about kind of what those struggles were, uh, kind of what, what, what were the hard things that you had to, that you had to face to get to where you are now? Is this a five hour podcast? <laughs> 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 because um well okay from the very beginning is where it started for me i was born into detox from drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. oh, um okay. and grew up in a very abusive household mm -hmm. um for the first three years of my life was removed from that with my sisters placed through foster care adopted um immediately at a very young age was placed into trauma therapy to overcome to start that process of overcoming um, but I mean, every type of abuse, physical, sexual, neglect, verbal, like, I mean, all the whole yeah. spectrum um, for me and all of my sisters. So starting off the journey like that was challenging, like the odds were stacked against me from the beginning. Um, but I, I really I have to give credit and so much love to my adoptive parents because they gave me everything I needed to overcome that. And I'm still to this day, I am faced with challenges and I'm still facing those traumas. Um, so 
it you know that trauma does follow you but yeah. it's it's the power of choice it's the power of positivity and how you want to overcome that everyone is able to it's just some people haven't found that way or that light yet um so and growing up obviously openly gay i could not hide this <laughs> even if i tried <laughs> Even if I tried, um, and I, I thankfully, you know, my adoptive parents are originally from San Francisco, very open-minded. Hippies, and, yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they were totally in the field at, in Union Square, I'm sure, smoking, doing all of the things back <laughs> in the things. 60s. Yeah. Um, so they were very welcoming, and uh, that made things a lot easier. However, the areas I was growing up in rural Montana were not not the well. most liberal place in the country no, no. um and it's like even to this day you know it's it's i my heart goes out to people who are finding their way uh in rural communities like that all all across the country and all across the world um but you know you just somehow for me i just knew that there was better things coming and I, you know, again, I, I really, I really praise my parents for allowing me to have that type of a mindset. Um, and I just followed that as best as I could. And there were a lot of struggles along the way, many relapses, diving into hardcore drugs and throwing myself into other addictions, sex, all, you know, so many different things. Um, but I always had that just that little voice that little inkling of like there's so much so so much more good coming your way you've got to show up you've got to choose it and um luckily i i did and then it's just kind of especially as i've been going through this journey publicly online um it my whole world has just flipped upside down turned inside out and it's just it's so worth it. And I can only imagine this is just the beginning. Yeah. You know, I'm only 147 days sober from alcohol and weed. Congratulations. And yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. That's thank you. Know, you. you know, Jason has what? Six, seven years. I'm coming up on seven years, almost seven years. And I'll have 15 in July. And we very often it's great. Yeah. But we yeah. very often like <laughs> we will romanticize those early, like those first six months. Like, yeah, <laughs> we'll look upon them fondly as the hard as they are the first right? year it's just like you know because I, I i got clean i was 42 when i got clean so um jason's very old yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like a kid because you know i used practically I, I was kind of a late bloomer when it came to using i didn't start really using till i was like 23 but i definitely made up for lost time and i you know i, I ran shit into the ground so um where all the people I grew up with and people like my age were start, are going through like midlife crises now or crises and like empty nest things. Like I'm just like, I feel like a responsible, like 23 year old at this <laughs> point. So I'm, uh, I'm good. So, so Bruce, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, being born to, to a mom who was using some sort of alcohol and drugs, right. And, and detoxing and, one of the things that um, that we know today in, in the therapy world is that, you know, trauma is something that our body can carry physically. And so experiencing that physical trauma, even though, like, you don't remember it, right? Like, you know, detoxing as a, as a child, you know, but, like, coming into the world with that kind of adversity really does kind of set up um, for a lot of these other issues, right? Um, so I, I guess my question is, when you know now that you've got 137 days sober you know and all these issues you know we talk about how like the issue is going to get addressed either in a healthy way or an unhealthy way right um so have you found that you know the sobriety needed to happen before you could start properly addressing the trauma the other process addictions etc has it been kind of like a you know piece by piece like where did your healing journey start like which of what thing did you fix first or start to work on first so it's been a long road um it's been a very long road many years of you, you know as i said i was placed into trauma therapy when i was four um so it started then 
I didn't reintroduce myself to my addictions until I was 16. I ran away from home for a summer, very rebellious youth, puberty, all of the things <laughs> hit all at once. Um, and I in- reintroduced myself to my addictions that summer in 2007. And uh, the first one I went to was meth. And I went pretty hard on that and then sobered up. For a small period of time, my parents, they, you know, they, they had all of the resources. So therapy, all all of that, but they also were like, you know what, I think that you need a lot more discipline in a different way. So we're going to enroll you in a dance academy and you're going to be doing ballet. I was for... thinking military school. <laughs> <laughs> and you just curveballed on me. Right? No, yeah, no. Um, they did do that with my older brother. Um, and bless him anyway um (laughs) yeah um so yeah they enrolled me in a dance academy and I did theater before that so being a theatrical person I was like oh like this is supposed to hurt me like what is you know like thinking this is supposed to be punishment or something and um in a way it was but I honestly fell in love with it and it allowed me to pursue my dreams of moving to New York City and um auditioning and trying to get in the Broadway world and whatnot but um and I'm I'm getting to your question yeah, uh, this, this is a great journey yeah right? I love it. <laughs> moving to New York when I graduated in 2009 from high school 18 packed my bags very focused I was sober and you were that kid with like a suitcase and a dream going to the big city to see <laughs> your really name in was. lights. Yeah. And I, I didn't know anyone. Um, there was a friend um, who I still love to this day, Landon, um, who I moved to the city with. And unfortunately, it wasn't it wasn't for him. So he ended up going and doing other things in life pretty soon into moving into New York City. And I stayed, and for the first year and some change, I was very consistent, showing up to auditions, dancing, enrolling myself at Broadway Dance Center, taking classes all the time. And the constant, I really let the rejection get to me. Mm -hmm. And I, instead of focusing or realizing that rejection is not rejection, it's simply redirection towards my yes, I didn't see that at the time. Rejection is not rejection. It's simply redirection towards my yes. That's that sounds like a bar, like logic. You know, like the <laughs> rapper logic just dropped that bar. <laughs> That's good. Did you is that is that all you? Uh that um no, I honestly I can't take credit for okay. that. Um it's a mixture of a lot of different inspiration that I've gotten over the years being in recovery. Yeah. Um and maybe in that specific verbiage. Just own it. Own it. Yes. That's all. Might. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes. sure. Yeah. Please don't sue me. <laughs> Whoever created that. Um, but I, I really, now I grasp that. And when, you know, people say no, or even things come into my life and I'm like, that's not for me. Like, you know, yeah. I just keep going. You're going to find what works for you. Um, so, and- so you're in New York, all this rejection starts to get to you. And so I'm assuming we're getting to some unhealthy ways of dealing with that rejection. Absolutely. I I was like, well, if I'm not going to get the job dancing in the dream show that I want, I can get a job dancing at a nightclub. So I took that route. And obviously, there's a lot of addiction in the nightlife. Yeah. And that's not a place for me. I was very naive. I got this. Like, you know, all of the things that we tell ourselves. And um, I really lost my way very quickly at uh, right before I turned 21 I was diagnosed with HIV and I went straight back to meth and just ran with that and went super hard with so many different hardcore drugs um and coped by escaping and by numbing and not facing any of my reality um and it just made things so much worse at the time i was like living it up and i thought like oh yeah. it's you know this is so much fun and right. all the things um you know i heard you just made me think of something there's uh, i was listening i've been listening to a lot of sad country music lately right okay which i understand that a lot of elder millennials are doing right now <laughs> all the all you're such but, a cliche but uh there's Are you going cr- through your midlife crisis? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. The, the sad country. But so there's this Chris Stapleton song, and he has a line that says, 
Falling feels like flying until you hit the ground. That's pretty good. And, and you just made me think of that when you're saying like, man, I thought I was living it up and that it was, you know, living my best life. Yeah. Yeah, so, not so much. So there's that there's that part, and and <clears throat> I know that I felt it too, where it was like, I think I'm an exception to the rule here. Like I could handle this. I'm a pro at at using drugs and being able to handle my shit. And you know, this is the thought in my head when I'm probably like nodded out, like on a chair with <laughs> cigarette holes in my leg, and I'm just like, I'm a fucking champ at this. This is I got it made. You know, um, yeah. So, so at what point did you realize that you were not so much living your best life in New York? Um. Oh, you know that one time I had a acute Hep C and uh, overdosed on meth, and my HIV was borderline AIDS, and I was in the hospital and um, was dying. Yeah. Um, did, so that it, was really that a realization you up. came to on your own, like you just in the bed and you just had a moment, or like? Was there someone in your life who talked to you, who kind of helped you see a little light at the end of the tunnel or what? It was a bit of both. I was really, I'm, I'm, I just, uh, thank you, higher power. I'm very fortunate. I have had a lot of people in my life really from the beginning, since I was placed into my adoptive home, mom and dad, we'll yeah. just call them mom, yeah. and mom and dad. Because they, they are my mom and dad. They're the ones that raised me. Um, so I've had a lot of love in my corner. I've had a lot of people leave my corner because of the pain. I'm sure just watching me wreak havoc, they couldn't do it anymore. So some of those people stayed, some of those people left, some of them came back, but I've always had someone in my corner, which I know mm -hmm. is for many people, not the case. Um, which is why I um, kind of at the beginning of this, I said I always had that little inkling within me to just push me that much further. Oh, right. Like, if you have that, hold on to that because that will that will turn into something great and magnificent. Um, but th it was a combination of things. I had, um, you know, I was basically squatting on my friend's couch, not paying any rent or doing it, you know, not being a, pr a productive human being. I'm not homeless. I have a couch to sleep on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, um, but it was after I got out of the hospital. Um, and yeah, while, while I was in the hospital, while I was laying there, I was like this, there's something that's not working here. Um, and, I checked myself into the Addiction Institute of New York, which uh, has a inpatient and outpatient rehab program. And I was terrified of going inpatient. So again, I was like, I'm going to take the easy way out and I'm yeah, just going right. to do outpatient. Um, but it worked. And I absolutely, for I think a year and a half, was attending these meetings three to four days a week. Your IOP. Um, and there was one day in particular that I, I just said, I'm done. I have to be done. This is it. And that was June 13th of 2014. I took all of the remaining paraphernalia that I had uh, for all of the drugs and everything, mainly crystal meth. And I took a little walk in Harlem and I went to the only mausoleum cemetery in Manhattan which is up in Harlem, pretty close to where he lived at the time. And I sat there on the top of this hill that had a mausoleum. I was basically sitting on someone's grave. And I found this rock there, and I crushed up my pipe and the remaining crystal that I had and turned it into dust, and I just brushed it down into this vent, which went down into that mausoleum oh so, he's high as fuck it's so, ghost I, I know i and like to this day i'm like i am so sorry <laughs> like, you I desecrated so sorry. the ancestors no. you have a oh. tweaking and, ghost cleaning your blinds at all hours uh, of the night well i just I, I, you know i want to point something out real quick you know because like you said like hey i chose iop because it was like the easier softer way right to do the outpatient where we hear that term the easier softer way mm -hmm. and i think it's you know it's important to note that like there is a lot of different paths to recovery, right? There are people who go to IOP programs and find recovery. Um, absolutely. Some of them are some of them are, are absolutely in denial about the need to go to inpatient treatment. Um, but it's not you know it's not the only way. Like 
you right. know, uh, so, so often in society we have this idea that like it's the down and out crackhead who has to go get, you know, go to re like it doesn't have to be. Yeah, there, there's no one size fits all. So and it, and it sounds like you got, you know, it, even though it wasn't permanent sobriety, right? Like a big part of your journey started with the moment that you had while in that outpatient program. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up because it is this isn't just a custom size one size fits all type of a thing. Um, it's completely really find what works for you and leave the rest. Um, and at the time, I was like, I was terrified of going into a inpatient, so I thought I was taking the easier and the softer way out. It was hard. It was not. It, it was not easy facing your your troubles, facing your traumas, facing recovery is not easy but it's so so worth it and now looking back at it yeah it it was a challenge again it was worth it um some people are just really in the thralls of their addiction and they simply just go to a 12-step program and yeah. they get sober yeah, just in meetings it happens and some people yeah. just say like oh my god I, I drank way too much last night that sucked i'm never gonna do that again and never do it again yeah you know it's, it's um yeah, yeah. But so, uh, so at, at that point, you said uh, June, June fourteenth, twenty fourteen. June thirteenth of twenty fourteen. There we go. Yeah. So, so you, you, you kind of. It sounds like you, you kind of internalized that desire to find recovery and took some some external steps towards it. Um, where do we go from there? Um, well, since that day in the cemetery, I have remained sober from hardcore drugs. It it, it was a really kind of a spiritual awakening moment for me because after I gave the ghost my drugs, <laughs> I, uh, um, it started raining and it was like I was just Cleansed. being washed yeah. away from all of this. And so that is my hardcore sober date um, from all hard hardcore drugs. So coming up on nine years, which is absolutely incredible and uh, continued with the outpatient rehab program and started to get my life back together again. Um, really having a hard time keeping a job still. And, you know, with my record and whatnot, it was just hard finding a job. Especially were you still pursuing dancing or, or what were you trying no, to do at that point? No, n not at that time. Um, I, I really put that dream away yeah. in the back of the closet. Did the so doing really it just doing did dancing in the clubs kind of tarnish that? that for you a little bit or um I, I don't think it was specifically that it was just my self-esteem my my self-doubt um a lot of my mental health diagnoses kind of contributed to a lot of that too <clears throat> i was untreated for bipolar 2 for over a decade and smoking weed and just you know doesn't help to take a depressant to fix a depressant yeah, <laughs> that, right. that you know it, it, it didn't pan out that way um but so moving forward i graduated out of the rehab program and um i think three of the most dangerous words that i myself can tell myself is oh i got this i got this i got this i, yeah. I got this and i'm cured no <laughs> um you know so <laughs> I um, started working for a friend of mine who, uh, Schwa, Schwa de Vive, who Schwa. was a Broadway performer and a drag queen and owned a cleaning company. So I started working for them and incredible human beings, so loving and just took me under their wing, gave me a job, became my friend um, and provided me with a very decent living and a secure income for years. So I started doing that and um, I realized I was like, oh, okay, like this is, was a great place to start and to launch. Um, they ended up selling the company and moving away. So I was like, I'm going to start my own cleaning business. So I did and, and um, called Have Bruce Do It. And nice. um, <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it, it was successful. It was great. And eventually um, I became partners with, a dear friend of mine who bought 50% of the company, uh, Francis, 
and we were also roommates and just kind of kept the family very close and became business partners. Did you change the name to have Bruce or Francis do it? No, we didn't. We kept it have Bruce do it just because it was so catchy. Yeah. Um, and everyone just loved it. So we kept it the same. Um, however, she's also an artist. I'm an artist. And it got to a point where we started to realize like, we're really not fulfilling our dreams here. Um, rewind just a few. I did get that dream off of the shelf again, the more I became sober. Oh, good. Um, and the more I started to find my self confidence and whatnot, the business started booming. I was like, oh, okay, like, you know, I think I can also do other things. And I started auditioning again. And I did. I got into an off Broadway show called Babel. Um, and it was telling the biblical story of Babel, but through dance and acrobatic movement. So lots of human pyramids. Lots. <laughs> yeah. Lots, and really just an incredible show, really an incredible show, which is where I met my now fiance. Um, and again, thinking, oh, I got this, you know, very, very typical of theater life after rehearsals and whatnot. The crew goes out to the bar, has a few drinks. I'm not an alcoholic. I've never been an alcoholic. You know, my thing was drugs and alcohol is a drug. Um, yes. So I did it is not a realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and soon, soon enough, there I was just drinking and then eventually coming to rehearsals drunk oh. and then going to the show like show day. Oh, wow. Just inebriated like you know so and, how long how long did it take from that first celebratory drink to showing up on show day drunk um i would say a month so quick oh oh yeah it's about typical i think like we joseph and i talk all the time it's like how long would it take you to run your life completely into the fucking about ground a month. and we all we both think it's like a month <laughs> Yeah, well, and it can happen even even faster than that because the last time I relapsed, um, I 147 days ago, I um, went to San Francisco to help take care of my uncle last winter who was recovering from a stroke, and I relapsed there, nipped it in the bud, really, you know, got back on track. I was like, oh, I'm slipping, I'm slipping. But I also stopped going to my outpatient program, my 12 step programs. I really put my program down again, that delusional, I got this yeah. thinking and behavior. So I relapsed a couple of times there, came back to the East Coast, was good, was sober um, for a while. And then all of a sudden, just boom, I was like, I was back in it like I never even left. And it was very quick, yeah. um, like a week and then I was relapsing consistently just all the time, like almost weekly. And then the last time I relapsed, I had, Oh, I don't know. I think it was like 30. Oh yeah. 31 days um, sober. And then I relapsed again. And within five hours I got a DUI. Oh, like, even faster. Was, yeah. Oh, so, five hours. So yeah. Real quick. I'd like to rewind to, you know, you mentioned when you first started uh, drinking with the with the dance company, you were like, "I'm not an alcoholic. Drugs were my thing. As long as I'm not doing hardcore drugs, I'm good." What brought you to the realization, like, of "Oh no, I also cannot drink." You know, when did you begin to seek sobriety from alcohol as well? Um, it was after the show, after the show had closed, and I went back to my full time cleaning business and just being miserable and showing up um, to the client's place and stealing their alcohol, drinking their alcohol. And it progressed like I, I you know, alcoholics and addicts, we can hide things really, really well. Sneaky, for, sneaky. Yeah. For an extended period of time until it really becomes unmanageable and then all bets are off. Um, and there was this one client that I worked for for years um, and I was there, basically their live-in maid and assistant and dog walker. I, whenever they traveled, I lived in, in his penthouse 
um, and he never had alcohol in his apartment. And then all of a sudden, one day I showed up and it was like a full bar that he had installed in his house. And he came home to me, passed out with the vacuum in one hand and a bottle in the oh. other. Um, <laughs> and it was like, it's still very just... You know, I really try and release guilt, shame, all of those things. But, you know, to look back on that period of time, it was incredibly embarrassing. And my partner, um, uh, the client went through my phone to contact my partner. My partner had to come um, and pick me up, throw me over his shoulder, put me in the cab and take me to the hospital because I clearly drank way too much. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was all spirits, like any bourbon, whiskey, anything like that. And then it just, from that point, I was like, this is a problem. I will literally drink hand sanitizer or mm -hmm. cooking wine or anything that will just get me drunk. And um, that's when I realized I really had a problem. And I started going back to... AA and a lot of different 12 step programs, just any program that I could get myself into checking myself back into the addiction Institute of New York and doing the whole thing again. Um, so it was towards the end of right before the pandemic and then the pandemic happened and that's when I got sober, which is so like, which is beautiful and awesome. But there are so many people who found their addictions. Yes. During the pandemic, it just it skyrocketed mental health addiction. All oh, of that I mean, 2020 up. as as people who run a rehab, right? 2020 was like, one of our busiest years ever. And I remember telling our clients at the time, like, hey, if you can get sober right now, <laughs> with everything going on, like you, you, you you're, got it. You're yeah. good. You're good. You got some intestinal um, fortitude. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. What, one thing that I love about your story is, you know, in in traditional twelve step recovery, especially like I, I I got sober in a place here in Texas where it's very like hardcore old school big book, you know, kind of in your face recovery. And mm -hmm. there's that very black and white idea of like, you know, oh you relapse like like. You fucked up, like, here's some shame, like, you're starting all over, you need to, you know, almost like like that Catholic kind of like, you need to confess your sins and right. whatever. And, you know, there was a lot of, like, folks who relapsed would get a little ostracized, you know, depending on their situation. So I love that you're so open about, like, you know, I came into the rooms and I relapsed at this point and I relapsed at this point and I relapsed at this point and you, you... It doesn't sound like ever during any of those relapses where you like, oh, my God, like I'm a horrible human being. Like I should just give up. Like you continue to show up. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that like the path to recovery isn't a straight line. You know, right. It's 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 messy. It's up. It's down. It's zigs. It's zags. It's it's all kinds of things. So I love that you're that you share that um, so publicly and, and in such a way where like I can tell like you don't feel shame about it right because it's you know it's just part of your journey to get to where you are today now i don't i i almost immediately let go of that guilt and that shame because it will hold me down for as long as it can but in the beginning i i i really had a hard time with the guilt and the shame and you know it just takes practice and i i also i just want to say that with the 12-step programs and with aa specifically i almost like that fear of going into inpatient because i really really needed it mm -hmm. um i had the fear of going to aa because i thought it was going to be so gaudy and there's a lot of trauma in my past related to religion and sexual abuse happening and so i really have shunned all of that away and it was one of the things that was keeping me from going to aa However, I was really fortunate to introduce my AA experience in New York City, where New York is very open. And, you know, right. um, so that quickly showed me, ah, it actually does not have to be that. And, um, you know, I learned what works for you, take it and leave the rest. Um, so one thing that I definitely see here is I don't see somebody who doesn't have guilt and shame. I see somebody who worked on their guilt and shame and found these ways to deal with it and overcome 
or at least, you know, every day find ways to overcome. So what is, what would you say to somebody who is struggling from that guilt and shame, who doesn't maybe not realize like, this is what recovery looks like. Like seeing somebody with this happy, joyous and free aura comes from a lot of hard work. So how'd you do it? Ah, that's such a good question. And I think I'm still learning. Um, I'm willing to be open-minded. I'm willing to not care. One of the key things for me to be free is you really have to let go of what other people think, say about you with what uh, you were just talking about with the guilt and the shame coming from other people inside the rooms and like ah, the finger, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> um, it's not helpful. It's not beneficial to anyone's recovery. Um, and realizing for me, I just realized that just because I relapsed, yes, relapse is a part of recovery. It does not have to be a part of your recovery though. Correct. So, you know, there's that. Um, and if you do end up finding that you were slipping and then eventually you end up relapsing to let it go, it has happened. It is all it's, it's in the past. There's nothing that we can do about it. And that's with anything in life. It's in the past. Let it go. Why are we living in the past? We're not moving in that direction. You know, if we're looking back here, you're going to run into some trees and it's going to hurt like hell. So just let it go. Um, just because you relapse does not mean that you have lost all of that experience of being sober. You still have that in your tool belt to draw from, to pull from. Um, sure. Is the day count starting over if you're a day counter? Yes. Um, do you have to be a day counter? No. <laughs> like, you know, it's really to each their own here. Um, but being gentle with yourself, giving yourself grace, giving yourself that room to learn and to be okay with letting it go because it feels so much better when you don't bring that baggage with you moving forward. Um, right. It only weighs you down so much more and allow yourself time allow yourself time to get good at what it is that you want to get good at. None of us start a job knowing everything about it. We ask questions. We or, take the time. Or being we go through human. Training. Yeah, knowing being everything human. about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so what you do now with your, with your social media platforms really speaks to a lot of people, really helps a lot of people. So, yeah, you got the, videos the, of like 5,000 people being like, and, oh my God, I needed this today. And that's so, that's amazing. The way that I became aware of you, uh, Gabby Cohen, who is our content manager. Hi, Gabby. <laughs> Gabby, Gabby's great. Gabby's amazing. Her kid, Wolf, 12-year-old, one of the coolest kids. So Wolf, he looks at our, our reels like, yeah. cause I'll edit them together and be like, is this shitty? Is this good? And then Gabby will be like, let me show it to Wolf and Wolf will give it the, <laughs> no, Wolf thinks it's cool. Wolf absolutely loves you. And I'm sure he would love it if you gave him a, a Hi, little, Wolf. Yeah. Oh. yeah, Wolf, I love you. a very cool kid, uh, recently out trans kid. Um, and we give Wolf nothing but love and support and Thanks for the, all the thumbs up on the reels. We really appreciate Shout it. Shout out, Wolf. Yes, I love you, Wolf. And congratulations on finding your journey of who you are as a human being. That's so beautiful. So, so Bruce, what? when did you first decide that this was what you were going to use your social media platform for? Like, when did you decide, like, I'm going to post positive videos? Or did it just kind of start to happen? <laughs> like, So I started out, my partner said bruce you've got to put your because i'm a portrait artist that's what i do as well that, that's kind of what started this whole journey um photography painting drawing painting okay. yeah painting bwbart.com are anyway. you gonna are you gonna surprise us at the end and go like this and show a a, a, a portrait of joseph that you've been painting, painting this the whole, whole time, time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah, why don't i think ahead um <laughs> yes i mean yes okay no. <laughs> Um, so he's, he was like, you need to put your time lapse videos of you painting. Cause I, I will record myself and fast forward from mm -hmm. start to finish of a painting. Um, and I started doing that. I had Instagram 
And I think I only had like maybe 300, 400 followers um, at that time only. That's still a lot of people. That's an off-Broadway theater, if anyone's <laughs> um, You know, if 400 people are looking at you. That's pretty intimidating. Um, so that's where it started. And he was like, you need to get on TikTok and you, like, you should do that there too. The kids and are on TikTok quite- nowadays. Yeah. Okay. And this was at the, this was really, I think it was 11 months into the pandemic. So people were still very much glued to their phones and doing everything online. Um, and I, you know, I started doing that and um, there were a few other videos that I started to see the views would increase of like, um, I would do the same style of the time-lapse videos but then i would do a voiceover kind of sharing a little bit about myself i was like oh okay they're interested in that so i'll just keep doing that and then i had that dream kind of that uh performance art dream it's kind of separate but i've always wanted to be a motivational speaker i've always also wanted to go down that road eventually in my life and i was like well why not why not here and there was one video that I I did in the woods here in my house where I pop out from behind a tree and I run up to the camera in a beautiful gender fluid outfit and it just it took <sighs> off. Blew up. Yeah, it just it it really just took off. And I was like, ah, I've nailed it. This is what <laughs> they like. This is what I like to do. Um, and I'm just going to continue with this formula. Did you have to analyze it? Like, is it the tree? Is it the outfit? What made this one the one? Was your fan in that one? It was so, no, no, I didn't have the fan yet. Um, which is right here. (laughs) Um, I always keep it with me, (laughs) but I, I did. I was like, okay, this is allowing me to start to share my message and, I, I noticed that it, I, I was happy. I was sharing something that was dark in a happy way. And that made it really relatable. And once I started to connect all of the dots um, and I said, negativity be gone in that video. And I think that was something that people were like, oh yeah, like connect to that. So I just, I held on to that with all of my might. And I was like, okay, this is it. This is what I'm going to be doing. I need to start sharing my journey through this experience. And I'm just going to keep pushing negativity be gone because there's so much negativity. Um, And now it's segued into other things like the power of positivity and the power of choice and uh, keep moving forward or other slogans of mine. But it, you know, once I noticed something was working and I started to get something from it too, not, not the views. I mean, sure. As a content creator, we, that's how we keep going if it's going to be successful, but it's not about that. It's truly about finding a community where we can relate in a place that might be dark, but shed a lot of light and positivity on it. There are so many times in my life where I just thought I was at the end. I, I'm, there's no future here. Like I'm going to die basically. Um, What's the best comment you've received from, from your audience? Most powerful. You've saved my life. One thing I love about, uh, you know, recovery is when I first got to like the, the 12 step rooms, it was the first time I was able to, joke and find laughter about some heavy dark things like mm-hmm. you know was we always talk about like oh you shot up with a puddle of water i shot up <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um <laughs> and, and it, it's always seemed like man like we have this community when so many people lack it right so many people are going through life kind of alone you know or feeling alone and desperate and as an addict who was sort of forced into the rooms, I found like this wonderful community where we can joke about dark, heavy things and find that that light in it. And what you're doing seems to almost be bringing that experience to a broader group of people, right? They're like, you don't have to be an addict to find, uh, you know, to share, you know, you know, connect over some shared struggles and then find some shared joy in that. Yeah. Which I think is super, super cool. I love that. I also keep I thinking too. about yeah. like, uh, do y'all remember that old Seinfeld episode 
when it goes serenity now yeah. <laughs> serenity. oh yeah. yeah so like negativity be gone yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i like it i'm gonna use it <laughs> uh so uh, we are, Bruce, we are getting towards kind of the end of our time here for, for the show. And one of the ways that we like to wrap things up is with a little segment that we call Rapid, rapid Fire Question Time. It's Rapid Fire Question Time. So, okay. <laughs> so we're going to ask you five questions Super quick. You try to respond as, as quickly and honestly and easily as possible. They're not hard questions at okay. all. Um, I'm going to start off with a classic. Ben and Jerry show up at your house. They say, hey, Bruce, we would like to make a Ben and Jerry, uh, a Bruce signature flavor of ice cream. What would you put in that ice cream and what would you call it? Nougativity be gone. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good one. Um, I would say um, the rainbow slide. Rainbow slide. Okay, what's in rainbow slide? Rainbow slide, it would have a lot of positivity. Um, no, it would have... Um, it would have a whole bunch of different flavors, obviously consisting with the rainbow, but it would be like strawberry, kiwi, blueberry, a, a lot of the bright kind of things yes. that make your wa your mouth water a little oh, bit. I don't think and kiwi is represented enough in uh in, <laughs> in ice the flavor cream, world. So yeah, I like that. No, I don't think so. But I think that would make a lot of people happy. Yeah. I I'd try it. Okay. You get to curate a show, three bands or artists, living or dead. Who is it? Ah, uh, okay. Amy Winehouse. Um Mm -hmm. um can i be a musical guest <laughs> yeah yeah sure um, yeah you're in charge so yeah i would like to have a little appearance but it's not about me um amy winehouse lady gaga and elton john nice that's a good one nice that is very good bruce um, fest i'd go <laughs> bruce fest <laughs> um okay who is your go-to when you need a little bit of positivity, when you're Mama feeling Tot. who, what Mama Tot Ophelia on okay. TikTok. Okay. Right on. Yeah. So usually we, we say somebody out there who's still struggling, give them some words of positivity, but today Joseph's having a little bit of, day, of a rough day. So oh. could you give Joseph a little, uh, I know this isn't a rapid fire question, but I think it's, it's fitting. Okay. Yeah. I'm ready. Well, I like to do this, and obviously we can't do this over virtual, but let's pretend. I'm going to reach out my hands and grab my hands. Take a deep breath. Are my eyes open or closed? What are you... Whatever you want. Okay. So much good is coming your way. Take a deep breath. You are not your feelings. You are so much more. And you are in control of that. Take a deep breath. <sighs> Keep moving forward because you are doing a fantastic job. This feeling is not gonna last forever. And again, circling back, there's so much good coming your way. Oh, nice. <laughs> there is. Just like just like the world and the clouds and everything, the world is spinning at a thousand miles per hour, per hour, traveling through the universe at 67,000 miles per hour. It's going fast enough for us. We can all slow down <gasps> because it's going so fast. Those clouds are forever moving. So that sun is going to come out again. Right. Oh, I like right. that. That's one more. Really good. One more okay, we got one more rapid fire question. Um, okay. I'm just going to keep it food related. You have to pick one for the rest of your life. Tacos or pizza? <laughs> That's so unfair. That's a, that's a um, rough one. Oh my gosh, tacos. Yes. Good choice. That's good right choice. Answer. 
Yeah, tacos. Because uh, you can really kind of put anything in tacos, and it it'll change. Yeah, yeah you can make like a dessert, like the choco taco. Well, you know, you can you got a wide variety. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, well, Bruce, you know, thank you so much for making some time for us today and joining us from from your lovely home in the Poconos. Thank um, you. It looks very cozy. It does look cozy. Like the thank co- you. Cottage yeah, corn. It's definitely, it is. It's a cabin in the woods. Yeah. Oh, I just saw that movie with the Kevin in the Woods. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but so the last thing we like to do before we sign off is give you just, you know, give you the platform, give you a moment to to share whatever you'd like to share, whether it be something you want to plug, leave a message of positivity for our listeners, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, the next couple minutes are yours. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you so much for having me be a part of this amazing community that you guys have created here. Um, and to everyone behind the scenes, I fully love and appreciate you. You guys have a rockin' podcast. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say, again, you know, kind of what we just did with holding hands and breathing deep. Um, to anyone who is going through mental health um, issues, addiction issues, whatever your recovery journey consists of, I really want you to know that you are not alone. Oh, my goodness, you are not alone. There are 8 billion people on this planet there is a great chance that there are thousands of people going through a similar experience that might be completely different, but relatable. So you are not alone. If you are experiencing that you are going through a mental health crisis, um, there's so many different resources out there available to you. Sometimes, I mean, it can be as simple as a Google search, but on my, um, in my link tree within all of my platforms, I have resources there listed so if you need to go find some help you can find them on my link tree also if you're experiencing a mental health crisis or an addiction crisis you can dial 988 or text 741741 and there is a licensed professional eager willing and happy to assist whatever it is that you were going through um and you are loved i love you so much and you can recover you can get through this and um I also, you know, if, if if you don't vibe with me because you find that I might be too positive at times, there are so many other creators like Cute Lesbian, Mama Tot, Tony Talks, Jessica Kearson, Sober Motivation, What's Up Universe, Infusion Health Podcast, and I'm sure that you have a plethora oh, here man. on Recovery Unplugged for different things as well. So thank you so much for having me be a part of this. Um this was a lot of fun. And and for our listeners who this is their first time uh, finding out about you, where can they find you? What what's uh, what's your handle on all your socials? So it's the same handle on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. It's bwb.positivity, and my website is bwbart.com. Awesome, awesome. Well, Bruce, thank you just one more time for for a, a wonderful show um for for sharing a little bit of your story with us for sharing your message with us and with our with our viewers and listeners to our viewers and listeners uh thank you for joining us as always we appreciate you being on this journey with us um don't forget to like follow comment share uh tell your friends tell your mama tell your sister tell everybody tell all of them Um, tell everybody and until next time there's a thousand ways in and and a thousand thousand ways ways out. out And we hope you You find find yours. yours.